Well, where to begin? Alexander Hamilton was the first Secretary of the Treasury of the United States federal government. He was a prolific writer, he was a journalist, and uh, erstwhile poet. Alexander Hamilton was the great American paradox. Alexander Hamilton was an orphan immigrant turned founding father. One of our most controversial founding father figures. Like I said, he's a founding father in every sense of the word. Coming to the United States from that Caribbean island managed to put himself in some pretty interesting positions uh, with then General George Washington. Well, he was certainly a man of passion. Uh, he, he administered his political career uh, with aggression, with ambition, and we certainly know that he had a passionate private life as well. Sure, he was one of Washington's trusted aides. I think Washington saw a lot of himself in a younger Hamilton. He was incredibly motivated, ambitious, quite vain too. Hamilton was certainly the most powerful figure in Washington's cabinet, I would say bar none. What do you think? Well, we're in the house of Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton and Aaron Burr, uh, their relationship goes all the way back to uh, serving under Washington in the Revolutionary War, except that Hamilton came out more positively. He was more favored by Washington. Not so much Burr. Uh, Washington didn't trust Burr, and they continued to cross paths over the next couple of decades. I would say Aaron Burr's harder to nail down. Aaron Burr is, I think to this day, we are still trying to figure out who he is. And I think we really don't know much about Burr until you look at the third act of his life. It, politics is the short answer. Uh, their, their division really was mostly political. It began uh, when Burr ran against Hamilton's father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, and in fact took his position uh, in office. Uh, what led to the duel is Hamilton made an offhanded comment at a dinner party, which we can best describe as gossip. And it gets to the point where Burr wants retraction of anything Hamilton had said, and by that point, it was the point of no return. Hi, I'm Larry Stanley in Weehawken, New Jersey. This is Channeling Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was an orphan immigrant turned founding father. He was born poor in the Caribbean, abandoned by what little family he had uh, at a young age, who through luck, opportunity, intelligence, and ambition, rose in New York City, uh, gained a prominent legal career, and was a, uh, a leader at the Constitutional Convention, a key booster in constitutional ratification, a revolutionary war hero, the first Secretary of the Treasury, and one of the most influential uh, founders of the United States of America. Well, where to begin? Alexander Hamilton was the first Secretary of the Treasury of the United States federal government. He was a prolific writer, he was a journalist, and uh, erstwhile poet. He tried dozens and dozens and dozens of cases over his career, ranging from issues like you know, criminal cases like murder and all the way through seditious libel, which was a very, very present issue in the period in which he was involved in public affairs. Uh, my particular interest, or my research interest in Hamilton, stems from his um, work on intellectual property specifically. He was the first copyright lawyer at the federal level in the United States. Hamilton grew up in the West Indies, super poor. Uh, his father abandoned him when he was young, and his mother also died. He stayed with his extended family, and um, that was rough for him. One of his family members even took their own life. Um, he knew he'd have to be a self-made man coming from that environment, so he began working as a clerk. He had a dream of coming to North America, so uh, eventually he, he caught a boat and uh, made his way to New York, where he became a lawyer and eventually uh, joined the military. I like to think of Hamilton this way. Hamilton was that guy who transferred to your high school out of nowhere and immediately became popular. Not only that, 
he starts dating the girl that you've been liking since the third grade, except in the context of American history, that girl or the person whose favor he won over turned out to be George Washington. I think that uh, it was very apparent even from a young age. He excelled. Um, I think he continued to, to kind of work his way up. When the revolution started, he gets in as an um, aide-de-camp to, to Washington. They form a very close bond. Um, it's the first start of his military career, and um, you know, like I said, it, it, from there, it, it, he kind of just, it's, it's a skyrocket. Managed after coming to the United States from that Caribbean island, managed to put himself in some pretty interesting positions uh, with then General George Washington, invited to be a member of his cabinet, and from there, did some incredible things for our country that were almost lost to history. So who was Alexander Hamilton? Uh, I don't know, I just know he's on the $10 bill. Do you know what uh, bill he's on? Uh, Hamilton's on the 20? The 20? Ten? Do you know what bill Hamilton's on? <laughs> Hamilton's on the 10. <laughs> Henry, what do you know about Alexander Hamilton? Um, I know, isn't he like on the $10 bill? First question, who was Alexander Hamilton? That's a good question. Um, he was fundamental in the development of the United States from making the United States from the British. So Hamilton in the Revolutionary War begins much like many other uh, upwardly mobile-minded young men in the 1770s. He, sincerely, he is sincerely committed to the Patriot cause. He believes very firmly in political and economic independence from Great Britain. And he writes a series of very powerful pamphlets to this effect in the, in the years leading up to the revolution. Once the war begins, Hamilton leaves his studies at King's College, which is now Columbia University, and quickly rises through the ranks of the, the Revolutionary Army to become a primary aide-de-camp to General George Washington. And it's really under George Washington that Hamilton's political career begins. And if I had to distill really what makes Hamilton so successful in this period or so successful in an aide-de-camp, which basically would have been the equivalent of a personal assistant to the general, was his tremendous gift for infrastructure and organization. And you really see it starting in this period. You see the first iteration of, of how he's going to think about organizing society, how he's going to think about organizing sort of the state of affairs that he has to confront. And he is remarkably efficient, he is remarkably disciplined, and he it becomes an invaluable resource to Washington in this period. He was one of Washington's trusted aides. I think Washington saw a lot of himself in a younger Hamilton. He was incredibly motivated, ambitious, quite vain too, but this came across as confidence to Washington. So Washington trusted Hamilton with the decisions that he left him to make. So Washington and Hamilton's dynamic is really a subject of, I wouldn't say controversy, but it's certainly a subject of debate amongst historians really through the present day. Hamilton and Washington were certainly close. It was certainly a relationship predicated on deep mutual respect and admiration. It would not have been what you would qualify as an informal relationship or even necessarily a familial one. Uh, Hamilton was deeply loyal to Washington, largely because of how supportive Washington had been of his career, and he really recognized Hamilton's incredible gift for, for organizational strategy at a really young age. Hamilton and, and Washington were very close um, as during the Revolution. He had served in some of the ma most major battles at Trenton. And um, he, like I said, he becomes somebody that Washington turns to during, uh, during his time as leading the army and during the, the Revolution. Um, he's very, uh, like I said, he, he's, he's a competent soldier. I think it's something that he clearly enjoyed. He ends up going back to it later in life as well. Um, but he, like I said, it's, 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 he kind of sees it as, as a means to, to further his, his status, too. Hamilton married into the Schuyler family. Uh, Philip Schuyler was a decorated war hero. He marries uh, his wife, Eliza Elizabeth, 
who was from exactly the kind of family that he was looking for. She had means, she had connections, um, she had the opportunity for him to introduce himself to a strata of New York society that for an orphan immigrant normally would be closed off to him. So and I think really in order to understand Hamilton's um, really complicated relationship with his wife, um, Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, it really is important to think about Hamilton's first family or where Hamilton came from. Hamilton was an orphan. He lost his mother, Rachel, under um, really traumatic circumstances at a very young age. Um, he was likely 10, right? There is a little bit of debate about his Hamilton's exact birthday, but it is certain that he was orphaned very young. Hamilton also did not have a close relationship with his father. He was born in, once again, a dubious, perhaps illegitimate situation and had a very limited relationship with his uh, biological brother. He grew up in St. Croix, um, right next to what we would call a very traumatic circumstance. He was quite literally growing up on the docks next to the slave trade. And this certainly left, this trauma, and I think trauma really is the appropriate word to describe it, left him, I think, with a real need for a collected family life and a real desire to have that stability and security and real safety that came with Elizabeth Schuyler's family connections as well as her social and political ones? Yeah, Hamilton had uh, several children, uh, was married to Betsy Schuyler. Um, he seems to have accepted the responsibility of being a father, um, and fair enough as a husband, although there were some miscues there, he had at least one affair, but we see him develop a very loving fatherly relationship with his children through the primary source letters that he left behind. Unlike his own father, um, who he did not have quite a well-developed relationship with. Um, of, of, he seems to be a very uh, involved father um, to a degree. Uh, he he's, he's, seems to love his wife. Um, and he seems to have a fairly normal 18th century, late 18th century life um, and in every sense of the word and um, until the scandals kind of rock. And even then, you know, like I said, his marriage survives that. Well, when he first, when he initially connects with Eliza Schuyler, uh, which is during the Revolutionary War, it is by all description a genuine connection. He does seem to develop a really deep affection for her. Hamilton is pragmatic in all facets of his life, and there is a somewhat infamous letter in which he writes to a friend of his um, about his desire to find a wife that would be just smart enough, but not too smart, just wealthy enough, but not, you know, excessively wealthy, perhaps. Although if she was excessively wealthy, that wouldn't be the worst thing. And I am paraphrasing here. But he definitely was looking for a wife of a certain stature. He was looking for a wife that would provide an entree into an aspect of society that he was very interested in, in connecting with. And yet you also can access Hamilton's love letters to Eliza in this period, which are truly beautiful and uh, do speak to what seems to be a very sincere connection between the two of them, even if that connection was perhaps in the very, very early stages somewhat strategic on his, on his end. While in America, Hamilton got married and uh, had a questionable relationship with his sister-in-law. That scandal was something in American history that many don't agree on. Um, his sister-in-law was named Angelica Church, and um, they were super close. Him and Angelica would... Um, flirt with each other, and they would go to these family, uh, family gatherings together, and they would secretly like each other. And no one suspected much, because uh, when you're in a family, you're supposed to be close. Um, they wrote each other letters, and even, uh, Ham uh, even Angelica joked with Hamilton's wife that she wanted to borrow him on several occasions. And yet, I think it is safe to say that Hamilton certainly had a self-destructive streak. Uh, without trying to sound too much like a psychologist, because I'm a historian, not one, not a psychologist, but there was definitely a, an aspect of his personality that sabotaged that very same family life that he was so committed to building. 
Now, you know I'd ask Hamilton about Angelica Schuyler. That is a relationship that is full of rich historical uh, entertainment, as I like to call it. Uh, Angelica Schuyler and uh, Hamilton, Angelica is uh, Betsy's sister, Hamilton's wife's sister, and they have a mutual fondness, and I would call it an intense fondness. The historical record gives us enough information to be suspicious about their relationship. It leads us to a door, and behind that door, we have to fill in with the imagination. Could it have been completely platonic? Yes. But in my historical analysis, it's more likely that there's another Fifty Shades of Grey novel behind that door. Well, you know, there is the, the classic expression where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, Hamilton and Angelica Church certainly had a highly flirtatious relationship. Angelica and Alexander Hamilton were attracted to each other. Uh, the other side of that story, of course, is Hamilton's relationship with Eliza's sister, Angelica Schuyler Church. And I think there can be often a false dichotomy between them. Eliza is sweet and kind and mellow and domestic. Angelica is fiery and passionate and, and witty and mercurial and fiercely independent. Once again, those are uh, stereotypes perhaps more than anything else. These were living, breathing, active, intelligent women, both of them with political and cultural values. And while Angelica perhaps was the more vocal intellect, uh, she certainly had an extraordinary mind and was very uh, politically engaged. Eliza was very bright as well, but they were very different people um, in, their, in their demeanors and their personalities, and they were incredibly close. And together, they all, they shared a very close familial relationship. Angelica is one of the more intriguing uh, women um, of the late 18th century. She was charismatic, she was intelligent, she had extensive correspondence with a number of influential Americans, including Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Um, anybody who could bridge these two political rivals and, and maintain friendly and, in fact, even flirtatious correspondence with both uh, speaks to a bit of her personal charisma. And indeed, flirtatious is the word that we have to use when we talk about Alexander's uh, relationship with his wife's sister. They were, I think with Hamilton, when you get somebody that's an intellectual like he is, he, like, uh, he, he consumes uh, dialogue. He consumes uh, finding somebody that, that he has that mental spark with. I think he saw his sister Angelica, or his sister-in-law Angelica as a, uh, somebody, a confidant that he could, uh, he enjoyed conversation with her. They wrote letters back and forth. They were very close. And this was in a time when your extended family uh, in-laws were considered close-knit, as close-knit as blood relations. So um, I think he, they did play it up. I think they knew that they also had maybe a physical attraction to each other, but they, I think it was, I don't believe it was acted upon. I think that's entirely possible. When you've got a bunch of attractive single people in their late teens, early 20s, the hormones are bouncing all over the place. So I think that's entirely possible. You just have to... I think even at that point in your life have to say, okay, as, as she did, uh, this man and my sister are interested in each other, so I'm going to back as far out of the picture as I can. We have no evidence of any physical uh, contact. However, the letters are remarkably intimate, um, flirtatious, and there, sh there certainly was a, um, a mutual respect and emotional connection between the two of them. That uh, that, that I think both of them drew considerable satisfaction from. But I, I, I don't think there's a sufficient evidence to say that there was a physical relationship. So it depends. I mean, he did have an affair. We know he had at least one affair. That was the first American sex scandal. Is it, oh, yeah, that's right. Is it foreseeable to think if he had one affair, there was probably another one? Yes. That we don't know about? Yes. Right, is it right. foreseeable that it was with his sister-in-law? Yes. Uh, so is there any hardcore evidence? No. Whether that was a flirtatious relationship that ever became physical or whether it was the kind of flirtation predicated on uh, two people that shared a very strong intellectual connection can really, it's, it is really hard to say. The evidence that points to the fact that the relationship might have been physical is that after Hamilton's death, 
uh, his surviving children and Eliza did seemingly cull or remove many of his papers. There was the destruction of a lot of his letters, a lot of his personal documents. Whether those letters perhaps indicated a more physical relationship with Angelica, it is unclear. We, we can't know for sure. What is certain is that Angelica and Eliza had an incredibly close relationship, an incredibly close relationship that survived their entire lives without any signs of disruption. And that, to me, points to the fact that the relationship never went beyond a realm in which Eliza would have been comfortable with it. And I think in this instance, perhaps it's best to consider Eliza and Angelica's perspectives, perhaps more than Hamilton's himself. Though they were physically attracted to each other, that Angelica would not have acted on it because of her sister. I think that based on what we understand about Alexander, that had he been permitted to act on it, he probably would have. But I do think that, that the essential part of their relationship, which was this, this strong intellectual attraction, was definitely there. And the physical attraction is, guess what? None of our business. <laughs> uh, and then after the war, uh, during Washington's presidency, Hamilton served as our country's first Secretary of the Treasury, where he made his greatest impact in American history, um, essentially creating the American financial system. We're here with David Cowan from the Museum of American Finance, and we're going to talk about Alexander Hamilton in the Hamilton Room, which seems wildly appropriate. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is the patron saint of the Museum of American Finance. He is the architect of America's financial system. Okay, explain that. Let's just jump right into it. What did he do to contribute to America's financial system? So, before he took office, he was the first Secretary of the Treasury. He comes into office in 1789. The national public finances are bankrupt. We don't have a central bank. We don't have a banking system. We don't even have a U.S. dollar. We're using foreign coins. Fast forward six years to the time he leaves. <clears throat> Our national economic uh, system is in place. We've got a financial system with good credit. We have a central bank, we have a banking system, and powerfully we have our own currency, the U.S. dollar that's tied to gold or silver. Hamilton's greatest contribution is undoubtedly his work as the uh, first Treasury Secretary, where he functionally uh, designed the government's relationship with the economy, a relationship that, while it has changed, largely still mirrors the vision that Hamilton uh, laid out um, in the late 18th century. Also, that musical is really good. I think we have to give Hamilton some credit for that too, right? Yeah, Hamilton helped restore America's credit. At the time that the new nation is being developed, America's debts needed to be repaid. Hamilton effectively sets up the system that gets America on track to the uh, expense of his own personal finances. He's working on making, making sure the nation has great credit and has solid financial standing, but he suffers personally financially for the contributions that he made to American society. Okay, now let's go and backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about Alexander Hamilton, how he became Secretary of Treasury. What led up to him being appointed that position? Uh, well, Washington was uh, elected the first president of the United States. He takes the oath of office about 100 yards up the block here, April 30th, 1789. And he needed someone to run the Treasury, to run the nation's finances. His first choice actually was a gentleman named Robert Morris, who had been the financier of the American Revolution and he turned the job down. And the next person in line for that, fortunately, was Hamilton. Hamilton is George Washington's indispensable man in both war and peace. During the war, as you know, he was a senior aide to him, helped write much of his correspondence, was by the great man's side during battles and afterwards. And then during his presidency, he's by his side again as his Secretary of Treasury. And he had a bold economic vision for America. Now, there's a lot of speculation uh, during Washington's presidency that Hamilton was actually calling a lot of the shots. Do you agree with that? Was he kind of... So the Virginians, and there's you know, several in the cabinet, we mentioned Jefferson, Edmund Randolph is the attorney general, Madison and others felt, yes, 
that Washington was being duped by Hamilton. I don't believe that. I mean, if you read the correspondence and you read Washington, Washington was a Federalist. He wanted the United States to succeed, and therefore he aligned himself with Hamilton's policies. In particular, though, one of the flashpoints was creating a central bank, and the Virginians all lined up on one side, uh, and then Hamilton was on the other. It got through Congress, but it sat on President Washington's desk, and he decided to go with a central regulating a monetary authority for the United States over the objections of Jefferson and Madison and Randolph. Well, I don't think they were quite as musically inspired <laughs> as the Hamilton musical might make them out to be. They were nonetheless um, tense interactions. And they did not immediately start off that way, right? Hamilton and Jefferson shared plenty of views in common. They first and foremost believed in the project of an independent American nation. And that would have been a really driving, significant feature, specifically in the 1780s, that would have led them, left them, quite frankly, on the same side in a lot of ways. But how best to go about that project and what strategies would be deployed the most successfully was really where this fissure begins within the first year. Yeah, Jefferson had a different idea about the development of this new nation. Hamilton would have looked at America as the, pre, the, the perennial power in the world. Uh, Jefferson saw a different America, an America rooted in old values, traditional values, one of a more agrarian society. And Hamilton wanted to be much more aggressive in the way that he would have built this nation. Okay, so Jefferson, Washington, Hamilton, they never got along. Was this right, or am I wrong? There? Well, the, the word never is a strong word. Certainly um, in the 1780s to pass the U.S. Constitution, right? The war ends in 1783. We have a constitutional convention, and Madison and Hamilton are instrumental in getting that document approved in the various states. And in particular, here in New York, they write the famous Federalist Papers, right? And the majority of them written by Hamilton, but then Madison as well and John Jay, which is explaining what the Constitution is used about. And jurists to this day, Supreme Court jurists, look back on those Federalist Papers. So they certainly got a wrong then. That break did happen in the 1790s. You're right between Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton. And that from that point forward, they certainly saw things differently politically and economically. Uh, Jefferson, as you're well aware, wanted a nation of farmers. Uh, Hamilton was much more aligned with the mercantile class. They also had different views internationally. Uh, Jefferson was aligned with the French Revolution. Remember, he had been ambassador there. Uh, Hamilton leaned more to the English way. So there were definitely major disagreements over time uh, that these individuals had. Hamilton was certainly the most powerful figure in Washington's cabinet, I would say bar none. However, Jefferson and Washington did have a at least in the beginning, a respectful, positive relationship. And Washington did have a tremendous respect for Jefferson. It's also important to keep in mind, Washington and Jefferson came from a very similar background. Yeah, public life is not a very um, lucrative endeavor. Yet Hamilton was a man of honor. He didn't see personal interest. He saw uh, an opportunity to make the nation better. And he was very confident in his ideas and his ways to restore or help build the foundation of America financially. Suggested in this document is that we assume all the leftover debts from the Revolutionary War, which were trading at 10, 20 cents on the dollar. Now, if you look at countries throughout time, today the Germans don't want to pay for the Greeks. Well, the Virginians had not been profligate with all of this spending and had not issued a lot of bonds, but people in Massachusetts the Carolinas had, and they didn't want to do it. So in the most famous trade in American history, Hamilton trades the capital of the United States to be on the shores of the Potomac with the Virginians close to their homeland, or their home state, I should say, in exchange for agreeing to assume all of this debt. And so that agreement was made with Jefferson and Madison? In a famous dinner table uh, meeting that took place a couple hundred yards from here on Maiden Lane. Larry, this is the place where Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison met. They met at Jefferson's residence at a dinner party, and this is where the capital was traded in exchange for the assumption of all the war debts. Hamilton got what he wanted, and Jefferson 
and Madison got the capital down on the shores of the Potomac. This has been made very well known because of the quote unquote room where it happened in the play Hamilton. This iconic image of Monticello, Jefferson's home, in which he placed a bust after Hamilton's death in his hallway. And a lot of visitors would come in and ask why. Why do you have a bust of this man in your hallway? And Jefferson, of course, has his own bust directly across. They face each other. Jefferson's bust is a little bit bigger, in case you think Jefferson is too magnanimous. But he would say, because this is my great rival. I vanquished him, I beat him, but this was, this was the great intellectual rival of my day. Now, let's talk about this compromise a little bit more. Do you think Hamilton actually pulled one over on Jefferson and Madison? These guys were constantly butting heads. So this compromise is 1790. Do you think Jefferson and Madison got what they wanted, or do you think Hamilton actually won this compromise once again? Well, Hamilton thought in terms of the whole United States. Remember, he came from the island of St. Croix and Nevis, and therefore he didn't have necessarily alliance to New York, but he realized the way to tie in the Virginians was to make this trade. The Virginians did get something for it. For the next 24 years, starting with Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, 24 years of Virginians don't have a long way to go to the capital. Now, they did feel hoodwinked a bit. They felt as if they had maybe traded something for nothing. And so, yes, to answer your question, they did feel a little upset, but they did get a lot out of the bargain, and we got a union. And in some respects, what is interesting, if Aaron Burr did not shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton in that infamous duel, Burr and Hamilton would likely not be considered rivals. Hamilton's real, or I shouldn't say real, Hamilton's top political rival was Thomas Jefferson. To use a sports analogy, um, Mets fans really don't like the New York Yankees. The New York Yankees fans aren't necessarily as concerned with the Mets, they're looking towards the Boston Red Sox. Aaron Burr is the Mets in this scenario, Alexander Hamilton is the Yankees in this scenario, Thomas Jefferson is the Red Sox, right? Jefferson was Hamilton's really big political rival in the peak of his power. 1791, Alexander Hamilton um, has a woman from New York call upon him. Um, she comes by and it's kind of the damsel in distress uh, classic trope there where she is saying that she has no money to get back home and she needs um, she needs to, some sort of assistance, financial assistance to get back to New York. You know, like I said, Hamilton kind of being a, a, a New York being his adopted home is kind of um, uh, sympathetic to her cause. Well, he was certainly a man of passion. Uh, he, he administered his political career uh, with aggression, with ambition, and we certainly know that he had a passionate private life as well, perhaps most notably through his year-long affair with uh, Mariah Reynolds. Uh, a scandal which ultimately cost him considerable political capital, uh, greatly damaged his, his political relationship, um, needless to say, also straining his private relations as well. So Mariah Reynolds is, um, I guess you might say she's one of the first truly infamous women in America. She was the mistress of Hamilton for um, approximately a year in the early 1790s. They conducted a secret affair while he was in Philadelphia and his family was residing primarily in New York. Uh, at that point, the New York capital had temporarily, or excuse me, the federal capital had temporarily moved to Philadelphia while Washington, D.C. was being surveyed and built. So Hamilton was there while serving as Secretary of the Treasury. His connections with Mariah Reynolds largely began when she came to his house explaining that she was in a abusive and, and violent situation and asking Hamilton for financial support, at which point shortly thereafter the relationship became physical. This relationship continued in that vein for a number of months, at which point uh, Mariah's husband, uh, James, allegedly got wind of it and began blackmailing Hamilton to keep the affair a secret. Sandra Hamilton with a sad story, and she is um, wanting a handout. Hamilton, of course, coming from a humble beginning as well, uh, falls for this, wants to help her, starts giving her money. She's attractive. He starts liking her. They have this affair. Hamilton's married. She's married. Well, come to find out, this lady, uh, Miss Reynolds, has been put up to this whole shenanigans by her husband, 
And the whole plot here is to blackmail Hamilton into get, getting money. When Hamilton was Secretary of the Treasury and his wife and family were up in Albany, this is when the capital had moved to Philadelphia, uh, a young quote unquote damsel in distress, a lady in distress showed up at his door uh, needing money. And so Hamilton lent her some money. And when he went back uh, to her place for repayment, she explained that uh, she could pay back uh, through uh, amorous uh, a deed, and so Hamilton got involved. What Hamilton didn't know is it was a blackmail uh, affair, and he started to become blackmailed by the husband of Maria Reynolds, and therefore he paid some money. And so this occurred, and then some years later, this is after he left office, uh, because what had happened was he was visited by some senior congressmen uh, who, who knew about this, but it was kept quiet back then. It was a different type of world. Well, it's going to come out in the newspapers. And so what is Hamilton going to do? He's going to get, in his mind, in front of this firestorm. And he publishes a long pamphlet where he says, yes, I was involved in this amorous affair, but my public service was honorable. I did nothing to injure the country. This was a private matter. Well, this was quite a firestorm when this pamphlet hit. It was quite a scandal. It hurt uh, Hamilton's wife, Betsy, uh, immensely. She tried to buy up and burn as many of these pamphlets as she could. And it was, it was a major scandal for the time. It was America's first sex scandal, correct? No question. He basically says that I am not embezzling money from the Treasury Department. That would be the gravest and imaginable. I am cheating on my wife. And this understandably creates a real hemorrhage in his home life. It creates a real tension between him and his wife, although they do stay in the marriage. And divorce is not common in this period, but it is, it is permissible. For example, Mariah Reynolds, who was almost certainly the subject of psychological, if not physical, abuse from her husband, James Reynolds, and petitioned for divorce and enlisted the legal services of none other than Aaron Burr. I think that Burr and Hamilton had plenty of reasons to be upset with each other. Um, they stood uh, aside each other in a numerous political contest, uh, also in terms of private ambition. Uh, I don't think that uh, Mariah Reynolds is a considerable factor in the rift between these two men. What? Who was Alexander Hamilton? Um, he was the guy who deserved to be president, but he never had the opportunity because he was shot by Burr. He got in a, a scuffle with, I think, Aaron Burr. And then Aaron Burr had, like, um, they had, like, a duel thing. And so then um, Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton. Okay. Who was Alexander Hamilton? Okay. He was a person that had a duel with Aaron Burr. And it was right up here in Weehawk and up the hill from where I live. And he lost. And he got shot. Do you know what the duel was about? It was about, I think it was about a banking problem. Um, I know they were involved in banking in New York. I'm not real clear on it. I should be because I'm a Weehawk resident, so sorry. But it's an interesting story. I just don't know the whole thing. That's all. Do you know what the was about? I know he's on money, and I wish I had some of whatever he was on. Money, not like drugs or anything illegal like that. But Talk about his nemesis, Aaron Burr. Tell me, in your own words, Kevin, who Aaron Burr was. In the house of Hamilton, tell me who Aaron Burr was. <laughs> Uh, Aaron Burr was a, uh, descended from a, a well-known family. His grandfather had been a famous preacher in America during the Great Awakening. Um, so a storied family from Princeton, you know, his father involved in the university. And during the Revolutionary War, particularly when we attacked Canada, uh, displayed exemplary, uh, uh, displayed exemplary courage on the battlefield. Aaron Burr was an attorney and politician in the late revolutionary and early national periods. He was a highly successful lawyer, notably also serving many times as a divorce lawyer. He was a, uh, an investor. He was a scion, a product of a very well-established family in New Jersey and he's perhaps most notable for his duel with Alexander Hamilton in which he shoots and kills him.
Hamilton and Aaron Burr, uh, their relationship goes all the way back to uh, serving under Washington in the Revolutionary War, except that Hamilton came out more positively. He was more favored by Washington, not so much Burr. Uh, Washington didn't trust Burr, and they continued to cross paths over the next couple of decades. Um, so Burr is an attorney, uh, so is Hamilton. Uh, Burr actually unseats Hamilton's father-in-law in a Senate seat in New York. And this goes back to the beginning of the rift between these gentlemen. So Hamilton and Burr's careers intersect in many strange ways from the time they are both serving as soldiers in the American Revolution. They are both successful, successful in the Revolutionary period. They both obtain sort of positions of authority within the Continental Army. However, it's really Hamilton who shines in, in that role. Burr doesn't quite achieve perhaps the same level of recognition in that period. And yet Burr is wealthy. He is from an elite family. He is a product of Princeton University. And he has plenty of other modes of security around him. Uh, they first connect both as attorneys in the first murder trial in the independent nation in the 1780s. They seem to get along fine. There's no real signs yet of any deeper rivalry or deeper dislike. Uh, it all begins really when Aaron Burr runs against Hamilton's father-in-law for a seat in the New York Senate and defeats him. Ham sure, it, politics is the short answer. Uh, their, their division really was mostly political. It began uh, when Burr ran against Hamilton's father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, and in fact took his position uh, in office. Okay, um, the, like I said, this, this, these two people, think of them being both from New York, um, and their paths, you, you would look at it on the surface and think these guys should be, should be, be some sort of, I don't know, comrades in arms. They are both soldiers, they're both, you know, lived in New York, yet they keep coming and just butting heads. And the first of this is when his father-in-law um, let's see, uh, uh, Burr runs against his father-in-law for the New York Senate seat, and Burr wins it. Talk about Hamilton's mindset going up to the door. Um, and let's go into his and Burr's relationships a little bit here. Hamilton and Burr, what started their tension? So if you look at one of the letters that were sent back and forth, Hamilton uh, is saying, hey, look, we've just been political opponents for 15 years. So let's dial the clock back and look at what those 15 years were. And it starts right here in New York, 1790 or 91. They're both lawyers here in the city. And what happens is Burr is running for Senate against Philip Schuyler, Hamilton's father-in-law, and defeats him. So that's sort of the first flashpoint. During the 1790s, again, they're lawyers. They are you know, competing, but they get along. We see that. But by the late 1790s, what happens is that Burr tricks Hamilton in the creation of a bank. And what the backstory there is that we needed fresh water here in New York. So Burr said, let's create the Manhattan Water Company. In the codicil of one of these things, he says that this water company can take loans and make deposits. And therefore, he opens the Manhattan Water Company, closes the Manhattan Water Company, opens the Manhattan Bank, which becomes uh, Chase Manhattan, by the way, which becomes J.P. Morgan Chase. Why is this important? Well, to enlist Hamilton's assistance, because the two banks in existence at that time were Federalist banks. The Democratic Republicans were not getting loans from these banks. Banks were highly political then. They were right here. You're on the uh, space of one of those banks, the Bank of New York. And therefore, they were blocking the Democratic Republicans from getting a bank. Now they say, you know what, we need fresh water, Burr says to Hamilton, tricks him, and now he's got his bank. So that is bad news. Burr makes the critical error of not deferring to Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800. 1801, Burr is vice president, um, but Burr had an opportunity to be president, largely by mistake, political flaw, but Burr could have taken the gentleman, gentlemanly option and deferred to Jefferson allowing him to be president. He did not, and I think this begins um, a problem with his political career, how he's received by um, people in his party as well as others. So Hamilton, even though he was not a uh, party member with Jefferson, Hamilton takes the extreme measure of 
supporting Jefferson simply to keep Burr from becoming president of the United States. So Hamilton helps block Burr from becoming president. And after Burr is ousted from Jefferson's administration and runs for governor of New York, Hamilton helps block that as well. Hamilton and his coalition decide to throw their weight behind Jefferson instead. Because while Jefferson and Hamilton had that, at this point, were in a completely, completely opposite ends of the political spectrum of the day, Jefferson was someone that Hamilton respected, where Burr was someone that Hamilton did not. And there's a variety of incidents as to why. There was an incident with a, um, a water scheme to bring more water into New York City and New York State. There was an instance with a, with a land company that involved speculatory practices that Hamilton perhaps did not fully agree with. And there was many of these incidents that were adding up over time. But the election of 1800 was the obvious break. But it only got worse after in the election of 1800 when Burr was tied with Thomas Jefferson for the presidency. And largely through the efforts of Hamilton and others, uh, Burr lost the presidency and ended up being vice president. Burr blamed Hamilton uh, for that slight, that perceived slight. Hamilton just tells everybody, hey, I know I don't like Jefferson, but I don't like Burr even less. And Burr brings New York into the fold for the Jefferson-Burr ticket. The tacit agreement had always been that Burr would be vice president, but when the votes are counted and they're deadlocked, Burr stays silent. And therefore, it is thrown into the House of Representatives. Making it even more bizarre, it's a lame duck house, right? Filled with a Federalist majority. So now we have Jefferson versus Burr, and you have the titular head of the Federalist Party, Hamilton, writing anyone and everybody saying, look, I prefer Jefferson over Burr. Let's cut a deal with Jefferson as long as he does four things. One, keeps the financial system as it is. Two, keeps us neutral. Three, keeps Federalist uh, judges and other officers in positions, not you know, get wholesale fired. And four, make sure that the Navy is still strong. And so effectively what happens is Jefferson gets the vote. Someone switches their federal, switches their vote to Jefferson, breaking the deadlock. Burr is going to be vice president, but boy, is his relationship now strained with Jefferson. And therefore, you know, fast forward to 1804, he's not going to be on the ticket anymore. But he feels effectively Hamilton has cost him the presidency. Yes, it was at a dinner party in New York. Uh, Hamilton made some comments about um, about Burr, uh, questioning his character. It was kind of like a he said, she said, but the thing that was reported was that he claimed of, of uh, basically claimed that uh, Burr was of a despicable character. And, um, you know, which in, in, in 18th century, we're talking, that's, that is the, the ultimate insult. Um, Burr writes to, um, writes to Hamilton saying, can you explain your comments? What was exact, what exactly was said? A lot of letters. A lot of letters is what happened. Uh, Burr uh, wrote angry letters to Hamilton asking for either an avowal or a disavowal of whatever comment it was that he made. Hamilton refused, claiming that he couldn't be, you know, one, held, held to expect exactly what he said at a private dinner. Um, moreover, uh, it, it wasn't of a concern publicly or, or to Burr even privately. So this continued exchange between these letters uh, ultimately left Burr feeling like he had no other option to restore his reputation than to resort to uh, the affair of honor that we know as a, as a duel. Um, Hamilton is a little bit coy on it, and he's like, I don't need to explain myself on what something, what, what, what hearsay may be out there about something I may have said or may have may have not said about you. He doesn't really own up to it exactly. And Burr presses him. He, he presses Hamilton and says, wait a minute. You, I, I want clarification here. You, it, people are, the, something was reported, and I need you to clarify, what did you say? And Hamilton again tells him, he's like, look, this is, we're playing semantics here. He's saying, if, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, he kind of equivocates a little bit, and Burr is, is at his wit's end. This man has cost him the uh, presidency. He, it has cost him the governor race in New York. Um, there's only, like I said, in, in, in the times of the, of the 18th century there, you, there's only so much that this man can take. Through a letter that is published that reaches Burr's attention, Hamilton allegedly made 
a disparaging comment about Burr. What that comment was was not recorded. It is unknown because it was considered too critical to repeat. But Burr gets winds of this, then follows up with Hamilton, Hamilton fires back, and ultimately it can only be resolved in this final stage of that process, which would be a physical duel. It's a little more than that in the sense that he knows he's not going to be on the ticket again after what happened in the election of 1800. Jefferson is not going to have him as his vice president. And therefore, he's the sitting vice president, but he has his eyes on running for governor here in New York. And in New York, there is a faction of Democratic Republicans. There's two big clans, the Clinton clan, the Livingston clan. They've got their candidate, Morgan Lewis, the former attorney general. And Burr runs against Morgan Lewis while he's the sitting vice president for the governorship of New York. He's going to lose that election. He's going to enlist a lot of Federalists, not Hamilton, but a lot of Federalists are going to back him. And therefore, he's viewed by Jefferson and other Democratic Republicans as someone who has left the fold by and large, something is going to happen that's going to set in motion the duel. Okay, let's talk about that. Since we're right here, what happens that sets in motion the duel? So after the election's over, Burr realized, you know, he's lost. He gets a newspaper clipping from a newspaper up in Albany that says there was a dinner party, which did happen, where uh, Hamilton's there, uh, Schuyler and a Dr. Cooper. And the Dr. Cooper relays what happened and says that Hamilton says that Burr was a dangerous man. And that had happened before, and so that wasn't the phrase that set Burr over the top. But he also said that Hamilton said something even more, and this is the word despicable, than that, and I can't even tell you what that is. So there's a lot of speculation. Gore Vidal in his famous book, Burr, the novel says that what was said was so heinous, it was something that Burr was having an adulterous affair with his daughter. We really don't know what, if anything, was said. Burr then starts writing letters saying, take back what you said, and Hamilton saying, well, tell me what I said. And then we get into all the legal wranglings of these letters back and forth, but a collision course has started. And it gets to the point where Burr wants retraction of anything Hamilton had said, and by that point, it was the point of no return. Okay, so these letters, let's walk through the duel process. They're exchanging letters, but it's not just like, hey, I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you, I'm meeting on the dueling ground. There's a lot of process that goes into setting up a duel in the 1800s, correct? Correct, and you work through seconds. William Van Ness was a second for Burr. Um, the thing of Pendleton was a second for Hamilton. And a lot of times these things are talked down. They can find a mutual way to calm the waters and work out an amicable solution, then your honor has been met and it's uh, fine to move forward. In this case, though, it did not happen. And uh, you know, it looked like Burr wanted a duel and Hamilton wasn't going to back down. So the day before is in some respects the most interesting, I think, because it gives you, I, th I think certainly from Hamilton's perspective, a lot of insight into where he was. It was certainly the actions of a man who understood that it was possible he was going to die. He made sure his will was finalized. He said goodbye to his immediate family. He spent time with his wife. He prepared himself for the fact that when he woke up the next morning and rode that boat across the river to Weehawken, there was a very good chance he was not coming back. All right, July 11th, 1804, across the Hudson River, Don, Alexander Hamilton, and Aaron Burr rode across shore for their fatal encounter that happened right here in Weehawken, New Jersey. They, uh, so on the morning of, Burr uh, is woken up by a friend. He is ferried across first, across um, to New Jersey, and um, he waits, and Hamilton arrives with his second. Uh, the two men exchange uh, probably bitter greetings.
Why'd you shoot him? He wasn't aiming at you. Um, I, it's, I think it's far less clear what, Ham, what, excuse me, what Burr set out to do that day. It's far less clear to me, and, and I would defer in this instance to, again, the wonderful book by Nancy Eisenberg, to other experts. Uh, Brian Murphy, for example, has written extensively on Aaron Burr in this instance. It seems that Burr approached the duel unsure. It seemed that Burr approached the duel once again, like many others, with the understanding that it was certainly possible you were going to leave injured. Was Burr perhaps thinking the most rationally when he decided to shoot Hamilton? Absolutely not. I do not think that came from a calculated place. I don't believe he could possibly have imagined there was any way that decision was going to go well. Dueling was becoming illegal, and it was certainly illegal at that point in New York State. Uh, it was, legally, it was murder like any other. It wasn't recognized as being something different, perhaps a manslaughter charge if you were shrewd as a lawyer. But it was illegal. It was a crime to do. And he shot and killed someone. So I think his immediate response was probably, how do I solve this? How can I move forward? If you've ever been mad enough at someone that you just want to take a shot at them, but immediately after you do, you want to say, okay, now get up. Just don't make me mad again. That's perhaps the mindset that Burr had. Who fired first remains a mystery. Uh, both sides, uh, the, the seconds from both sides claim that the other man fired first. Uh, but we know that Hamilton was shot just above his right hip. The bullet pierced his liver and lodged in his vertebrae uh, and rendered him paralyzed and mortally wounded. And he did die the next day. I don't think it was a, a moment of insanity at all. I think Burr was quite um, purposeful in his actions. I think the aim was well planned, and he shot, and he shot to kill. And that's what happened there. The enormity of the situation kind of hit Burr. He steps towards Hamilton to try to um, offer uh, assistance, and he is quickly whisked, whisked away, back uh, across to New York, um, the owner of the dueling grounds, the property owner, is uh, very much against dueling. And the reason why they were doing it early and why they were doing it uh, and why they had one party arrive earlier was uh, to prevent the, anyone interfering. Um, if the owner had been there, he was known to have uh, tried to basically stand in front of the two um, people and basically until they'd agreed not to duel. Um, but at that point, like I said, Burr has shot Hamilton. He has whisked, whisked away back to uh, Richmond Hill his estate, and um, Hamilton is carried across also to uh, basically a few blocks from him and where he dies um, the next morning. What's your best guess on why this door was so, resolved? Right, we, we don't know for sure what was in each of the principal's minds. Certainly, if we had told them the result afterwards, <laughs> neither of them, I think, would have been very happy uh, with what happened. It destroyed uh, Burr's career, and it ended, you know, one of the greatest Americans uh, that we know. So uh, it's tough to say in the mindset, but I think Burr up to that point had been, uh, had had it with Hamilton, right? He had felt that he had cost him not only the presidency, but potentially the governorship of New York, and had stymied him, and enough was enough. From Hamilton's perspective, his honor was at stake. Uh, he was against dueling. Right, he had mentioned he lost the son. He was against it, but meanwhile, he did go to that dueling ground. Uh, but again, saying that he was not going to shoot to kill, was gonna waste a shot. By the way, the, the Burr descendants and the Burrites all say, oh no, Hamilton put his glasses on, he meant to shoot to kill, he just was a bad shot, or that his arm was, you know, as he was hit, as he was firing, and that's why his shot went astray. What do you think? Well, we're in the house of Hamilton. <laughs> and one thing we know about Hamilton, we know this from the Reynolds pamphlet, etc. he told the truth. 
And so if he wrote that he was going to waste his shot, that's what I believe. Hmm. Sort of reminds you of that debate in Star Wars, right? With Han Solo in the cantina. Uh, did he or, or the bounty hunter shoot first? I don't think it necessarily matters who shoots first. I think it matters in which direction they shoot. Burr shot straight, Hamilton shot up. 